I hope you enjoyed the presentation from Marcus and especially you got essentials for, for deep learning desk. Now I'll share with you some techniques that we could apply in life sciences. Just, I just want to mention that I do not aim to give you a, a complete list of techniques in deep learning, but just the common ones that are widely employed uh, for biological or health data. So I'm sorry if you don't see here a technique that you expect to see. Um, I'll give an overview for each of them, trying to explain briefly the concepts, when they can be used. <clears throat> but and I, I want to really go into um, technical elements which you can see more in a seminar this afternoon and maybe more in the future, more advanced course, okay? So for the, the first technique, The, the, the first technique I'd like to mention is CNN. Well, in, in tours, is um, just to remind you of the concept of neural network, even if you just saw it uh, some minutes ago with markers, as you have no um, neural networks and used to imitate our point. Right? So of course, the most obvious or natural input to a neural network is an image, what we see, and then the most popular application of neural networks is in um, computer vision. Imagine we have an input image, XI. Okay. It can be an XOR image, but it can be um, something else like a sequence of RNA, DNA, or some omics profile of a patient. The important is that they all are read in the same way by the computer. And the input can be encoded into a vector of numbers. Each node or neuron here is the color measurement of each pixel in the image, for example. Um, each node in the next layer is the result um, of an activation function on a linear regression of all the nodes in the current layer, which is defined by a weight matrix W here, and so on, up to the output Y hat I. Okay. So we we have the uh, input X and output Y. Then once we predict the Y hat or uh, the predict value, we'll compare the Y hat and the observed value Y for every object I, and then we define last function. This can be uh, something like the mean square error or something else, depending on our problem or the activation uh, activation function we used. Then the goal is to find parameters W the, the way matrix to minimize the loss function by performing uh, gradient descent for back propagation that Macers um, told you before. Because now we see the protocol of performing a deep learning test, but here come several questions. Does it really work? Can we minimize the loss function? And even if when we can, is the minimum good enough? And can we obtain it in a kind of a reasonable time. For example, the encoding of in an image to a vector over pixels is somewhat too generic or too simplified, or we ignore um, the spatial dependency between the pixels in the image. That's the type of reasoning we use when when we play puzzles and then we, we put together the piece with the related patterns. Right? Um, one more thing with the dimensionality problem, let's have a look at these two images. On the left, we have a meter five, five pixels and the right kind of uh, three million pixels. Of course, it's too much easier to parse just the first one with only uh, 25 pixels compared to the second one. The problem comes with a full connectivity of neurons. It means that each neuron in a layer is connected to all the neurons in the previous layer. Well, the problem is, is that even not full, but really high connectivity. And the problem is known as the curse of the nationality. And there are two issues. The first one, um, the sparsity of our data. When the dimensionality increases, the volumes of the space increases so fast that the available data becomes sparse. Imagine you have um, 10 people stay on on online and the same 10 people uh, stay in in, in a world 
and then the same 10 people in a group, and then the 10 people in imagine one 100 dimensional uh, space. So that's that, that's problem, that sparse, uh, sparsity of data is problematic for uh, statistical significance. And to obtain a similar significance, we, we need a, um, that the amount of data should increase exponentially when we add uh, more dimensions. The second issue is the coldness of data. When we increase the dimensionality, the dissimilarity of data increases. Um, for example, if you look at two people, and you look at only one feature height, so they they either they different or not based on the height. And now, if you put the weight, you put, um, for example, the, the measurement of glucose, you put the the eye color, whatever. So when you put more features, when you increase the dimensionality, the it becomes problematic for for sort for sorting or for classifying data. So that's where we need a convolutional neural network. Um, so what, what is a CNN? Okay, so please don't confuse with the CNN, the uh, cable news network, okay, the Tavian channel. The CNN is inspired by the organization of our visual uh, cortex. The neurons, our neurons respond to stimuli only in a restricted region of the visual field, which is called, um, which is called the receptive field. And a collection of those receptive fields overlaps to cover the entire visual area. And CNN is a deep learning algorithm. We can take an, an image as input. We will assign the importance with ways and bias to different aspects or objects in the image. And then it will be able to differentiate um, one from the other. Okay. So in, the, in, the, in this network, um, it, it, in the, um, each neuron receives connections only from a subset of neurons, but not all of them, just like in the, in the full uh, connected uh, neural network. And then we can, in such a way, we can reduce the number of parameters. Like we have a lot of ways a lot of ways zero compared to a normal neural network. And CNN can also capture dependencies in space and time between pixels um, in an image. So the space dependency is about the relationship between nearby pixels. Imagine we have the two nearby pixels, they, have, they should have the same, um, I mean, very similar uh, coloring scale or a gradient um, scale. And the time dependency is about a relationship between different moments of the same pixels when we have a series of images, for example, in a video. So with this, the network can be trained to understand better the sophistication of the image. So the role of CNN is to reduce the images into a form um, which is easier to process without losing feature that are critical for uh, obtaining a good prediction. So how, how does it really work as uh, CNN? So here's the image with its pixel matrix. The, the idea is to take each square block of pixels, for example, the red one here as a new one, and instead of instead of each um, pixel alone. So this step is to build a what we call the convol convolutional layer in the CNN, which is central in the CNN. It performs an operation called convolution. It's in fact a um, linear operation that involves a multiplication of a set of ways onto the input, just like a normal neural network. So the ways here are defined as a filter of the same side to the block of pixels or the sliding window that we'd like to consider. For example, um, so uh, for example, the we here we consider a sliding window of three three matrix, and the, the future, the value of ways in the future, it represents um, something we want to detect. For example, in this, uh, with this future, we try to detect an X uh, form. 
okay, a small X pattern in the image. And if I multiply the future to the sliding window in the input image, so I just, I mean, just a pairwise uh, products and take some of them. I look at the, where they have one and one um, in the sliding window. So we have three of them. So the sum is three. So we got the, the value of three in, in the result that we call a feature map, okay? And the same, it, I, I will slide the window a bit on the right. Do the same thing here, there's no one one. So the value is zero. And again and again, we have three here, zero, five, because of their, they, we can find a diagonal, the two diagonals here, okay? Zero, three, zero, and three. Okay, so now we have a feature map um, that summarizes the presence of the small X pattern in the output. The, the, the high value five at the center of the feature map indicates that the pattern X is likely found at the, um, at the center of the image. Features like um, like X, like, um, like, like X here, like a uh, backslash, like a slash, slash the, the, the features we can handcraft, okay? Um, but the, the, the innovation of CNN is to learn the features during training, just like learn ways in a traditional neural networks in the context of uh, some specific prediction problem. Um, the convolutional layers are not only applied to the input data, for example, raw pixel values, but they can also be applied to the output of other layers. It means we can have multiple convolutional layers. And these allow for extracting low to high level features. The low level features like, um, like lines, dots, edges, colors, or, or gradient orientation in the image and high level features are like the, the whole objects or shapes in, 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 in the image. These layers will um, allow for reducing the spatial size or the dimensionality, perhaps decrease the computational power to process the data. And a problem, uh, with the output feature map is that they are sensitive to the location of features. For example, we have an X here and we have the number five here. So it's quite um, specific to the position of the X in a feature map. So the X will be localized at the center of feature map. So one approach to address this sensitivity, when I talk about sensitivity is, is about, imagine you have um, a football uh, with some patterns on it. And we try to detect, I mean, the same football, but just turning around a bit, but it's still the same football. So it, sh it should be the same object. So we should not be too much sensitive to the, the, the position of the, the, the features in a feature map, okay? So the one approach first this, uh, to reduce the sensitivity is to downsample the feature maps. Um, so how, how to do that? That's the job of pooling layer that we call the, the, the pooling. A, um, these layers are used to reduce the size of feature map in CNN and compress the information down to a smaller scale. The, the pooling is applied to average feature map and it will help to extract broader and more general patterns that are more robust to small changes in the input. I mean, just like the patterns in the full board that, that uh, turn around. Okay? Um, the, the layers will be performed after the convolutional layer and activation, I mean, you usually what you find in a unit for each feature map. So usually we apply a two, uh, two, two pixels uh, window, which try up two pixels. So for example, um, here for, for example, for, for much average pooling, we, in a feature map, we have two, four values, one, three, oh, four. Uh, we take the maximum, so it should be four. We have up 10, four here. Here, the maximum is two, so we have two, five, five, four, four. So if another another um, framework with an average polling, which is the average value, so one, three, four, we have two, and one, one, two, four, two, zero, we have one. 
for, for example. And then with this, we can reduce our feature map in something smaller, which is uh, also uh, suggest the, to reduce um, the sensitivity to the location of the feature. Okay, um, so that, um, that that's what we call the that's what we, we try to obtain as invariance to local translation of features in in um, in our our image, and then at the end, once we have we perform convolution layers polling, the different polling step will flatten. Um, we 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 obtain a number of feature maps. Um, so we will flatten these maps and write them down as a picture of neurons and then keep going with a normal neural network um, up to the output. Okay. Um, so that, that, that's the concept of CNN. And um, so CNN were initially were developed for images, for example, uh, for example uh, it means two dimensional input, but it can also be adapted for one, one dimensional sequence or 3D data. So then it can be applied um, for each different types of data in life sciences. So I'll not go to until, uh, but I mean, as the first attempt in deep learning is um, there are quite a number of papers about application of uh, CNN in, uh, in biological data. The second technique I, I want to mention is the recurrent neural networks, which are developed for uh, different types of data. So let, let's just go back to the ORI neural networks. These networks are only meant for data points, which are independent of each other. Right? Um, means we have an output Y hat determined from each input XI, and the XI will be independent from XJ. But if we have a recurrence, it means we have data in a sequence um, such that one data point depends on the previous data point. We need to modify neural network somehow to incorporate the dependencies between the, these data points because the information about the sequen um, sequential, uh, sequential order in, in, the, in the input data, we cannot give it, for example, with the CNN, okay? Um, so then we need some concept of memory that helps to store the space or, uh, or the information of the previous inputs to generate, to generate the next output of sequence. So in, um, instead Y hat, um, the Y hat I is a function X I in, in a normal neural network. Now it should be a function of xi and some state of the memory, the h i minus one. I mean, the, 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 the last stage memory. Um, for example, I have a list of uh, songs to practice. And the input x is the weather. Is it rainy or sunny? If it's sunny, I'm kind of motivated. I'm, I will practice the next song list. And if it's rainy, I'm not motivated. I'll play again the song that I practiced the day before. So the output yi, the song that I will play, will be a function of the weather today and the state of the memory about the song that I played the day before. Right? That, 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 that the, the situation in the RNA that we need to, um, to in, uh, include in the model. So um, on the end, a recurrent neural network um, is also a type of neural network. It's uh, somehow more special. Um, it is adapted to work for time series data or, or just data that involves sequences, for example, a, um, DNA sequences or text, I mean, and the, the sentence in, in human language. Um, for example, text, video, and the sequence of images. A time series, for example, the heart, the heart rate of blood pressure of patient uh, during several days, the stock price, for example. Um, and the recurrent network had a, it, it will um, process a memory to store historic information to forecast the future values. That, that, that's the goal. 
So um, this can only be shown in, in, in this now, program. just to summarize, uh, we have input x and output y. And with the RNN, we have uh, a loop of memory stage in, inside. Um, so about that, so, um, just, I mean, the stage of the memory will be defined as a function of the input and also the, the previous uh, memory state. And then again, the same in the same way as in the neural network, um, we, we had the function the output as a function of uh, activation function on a linear combination of the stage uh, HI uh, plus some bias. Okay, um, we have several types of RNN. Um, we have one to one, so like uh, we try to classify uh, an image. One to many, um, like uh, we try to to put a caption to an image when do we have an image and we like to generate a sentence that that represents um, the, the, the context of the image, okay? Many to one, uh, we have many inputs from different time steps that produce a single output. For example, uh, in the case of uh, sentiment analysis or emotion detection, we have a, a text, we have a sentence, and now we have, we have to say that if the text and the feeling, the, 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 the mo emotion of the text is uh, negative or positive, for example. Um, the many to many, the many possibilities for, 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 for this. Uh, for example, we have um, a translation, a machine translation. We try to translate English to French. We have a sequence, a sentence of five words in English, and we try to translate into a sentence of six words in French, for example. The back, um, the back propagation, I just uh, can uh, return a bit to what Marcus uh, said before. So we'll calculate the gradient of loss. We define loss function. We calculate the gradient um, against all the parameters in the network. And in, here we have, that we have a, uh, a sequence. We have many, um, many parameters in, in a defined order. So our gradient will, will be something, um, will be a, a product of different uh, derivatives. So it becomes something like that. Um, that will, uh, I say that that will give the problem of exploding or vanishing gradient. For example, for, for each of the each of uh, each factor in this product, we have a value just like us, um, slightly higher than one, but one hundred times of one or one, for example, we would have one hundred thousand. Okay, and if we have something like just uh, slightly less than one, zero nine. But one at times we would have something very close to zero, and then that's the case of exploding or vanishing gradient. But in 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 the, uh, in both cases we had a problem. Once we will not converge, and one um, it will stop. We we cannot gain information anymore. Okay. Um, there, there's some uh, tricks to to get rid of that and not get it to reduce the uh, the effect. And one is about adapting a network structure because somehow we we uh, we come up with a quite naive structure at the beginning. Uh, it cannot do uh, efficiently with the situation, with the data. Um, for example, I have this text in, in English. I grew up in France and I do deep learning, blah, blah, blah. After 200 words, I, I, I come up with, I speak fluently and I try to predict the next word. So, I mean, the information is not there anymore. I, I mean, we, we lose the information 
um, that I mean, just I grew up in France. The next place I would just say I speak fluent French, it should be okay. But if after two pages of work, words, I will lose information, and that's where we need to to modify our network structure in an uh, MSTM, the long short term memory network. So here, um, we 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 have a we have to we need to modify the memory system. Uh, we have a memory so uh, memory so uh, cell to store the information. We have a forget gate, and we we need to just to uh, let something not important to to pass through. We want to ignore information from input and output, and and each gate is a neuron. So this uh, activation function on the way we take some of uh, some neurons. So with this um, structure of uh, sp uh, special RNN, the LSTM, we managed to deal with a longer sequence um, in, in, in input data. Um, and also just come back to one question uh, that we, we had before about LSTM, can you apply for feature extraction? So here we have two kind of uh, memory cells, one to store information, one, one to forget information. So it's kind of, um, it's the, the place that we can evaluate the importance of the features so that in, in that case can be used for 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 extracting for um, classifying the, the the feature as well okay so the application of onion um again is, of course in is used in natural language processing in life sciences uh, it can be used for, for, for example, for forecasting the spread of virus, for um, uh, drug development, for example. Um, and in case of we, we need to uh, look at the, uh, how say the performance of uh, the trust in pharmacokinetics, we need to design the, the dosage of the trucks during uh, several days, for example. And one um one other technique is autoencoders. Autoencoder um there's a type of neural networks that learn that will learn to efficiently compress and encode the data, and then learn to reconstruct the data back from the reduced encoded representation to obtain something to obtain a representation that is as close as possible to the original input. Okay, so from, from the input here, we, we encode to reduce um, the number the, the, the number of features and then we decode to we reobtain the input. Of course, we lose something. And this uh, this loss will be de defined by the difference between input and output, and then we, we also we need to minimize the, the loss. Um autoencoders reduce dimensionality. Of the input data. Okay, so it reduces the number of features. So as the autoencoders encode the input data and reconstruct is the same thing, um, we we can say that it, it it learns the identity function in an unsupervised manner, or somehow we can say it's a self supervision. I mean, it learns by itself. Okay. Um, and um, because the the um, the neural networks are capable of learning kind of uh, nonlinear relationships based on the activation function, this autoencoder um, model can be seen as a more powerful nonlinear generalization of uh, PCA, the principal component analysis. What what PCA attempts to discover a lower dimensional hyperplane which describes original data. The autoencoders are capable of learning nonlinear manifolds. I mean, the manifolds something like a uh, continuous non-intersecting surface. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, autoencoders can be seen as uh, a PCA, but some some somehow is more general. The autoencoders only trained to encode and decode 
with as small as the mo as small loss as possible, no matter how the latent space is organized. Okay, so if we, we are not careful about the definition of network architecture, um, it would be it, it can be natural that during training the network takes advantage of any overfitting possibilities to fulfill its job. Okay, so unless we find a way to regularize it, um, that, that, that's the notion of regularization that Marcus uh, has also mentioned before. And one technique to deal with that is about variant, uh, variational uh, autoencoder. That's kind of autoencoder uh, which the training is regular, uh, regularized to avoid overfitting and ensure that the latent space has good properties um, that will enable a uh, generative process. The idea here is, to, is instead of mapping input into a fixed vector, we want to, to map uh, the input into a distribution. In other words, we uh, the encoder outputs two vectors, a vector of means, I mean the average, and another vector of standard deviations. So instead of encoding input as a single point, we encode the input as a distribution over the latent space. So the model is then trained uh, train in four steps. We encode the input as a distribution and then a point from a latent space will be sampled from the distribution. Okay, well, we have a distribution, we just generate uh, one, one sample from with the, the, the lower with the distribution. And the next one, the sample point will be decoded and we compute the reconstruction error. And finally, the reconstruction error will be back propagated through a network to optimize to. Um, to modify the parameters to just to reduce to sort of minimize the the loss function. Um, auto encoders, uh, of course, it can can be used in different using imaging for denoising for compressing the images. Uh, denoising for yes, for example, in M uh, MRI images. Yeah, for example, we, we have uh, during entry, we have something we have liquid inside. And with this technique, we can denoise. I mean, we can remove uh, the layer of, of the liquid in, in your image. So we, we can see better uh, the information about the entry, for example. In, in life sciences, um, it, can, it can be used to uh, for, for, for feature selection, for dimensionality reduction. And also, um, imagine we have omics data, uh, transcriptomics, polyomics, etc. We have several, several thousands of um, features, and then we, we we need to reduce. We need to obtain a set of features in a reasonable size before performing a data equation, for example. Yeah, so um so next one I um I'd like to talk about is the attention mechanism and transformers. Okay. Let's have a look at this um this problem of neural machine translation for automatically translating text from one language to another using AI. The process is that um from an input sentence in a source language. Uh, a neural network, usually an RNN or LSTM, will play the role of an encoder to encode input into a fixed length vector. And yet another neural network will play as the decoder to decode the vector into a sentence in the target language. Okay. Um, for, 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 for example, um, in, in these two sentences, I do deep learning, and one sentence that I, I yet generate uh, get ChatGPT to generate from the four words I do deep learning. So here we see the, the, the bottleneck. As the input is encoded into one fixed length vector, okay, the, the amount of information, uh, propagated information, is limited. 
So the performance should be different with inputs of different lengths. So we have a sentence of four words and a sentence of four, 40 words is not the same thing. And we, we, we will translate um, less efficiently in, in longer sequences, of course. Um, so the we need um, somehow to deal with uh, the, the layer of the bottleneck you know, of the fixed land vector. So here comes the attention mechanism. Um, and so it's kind of a break in, in 2017 uh, that uh, the authors, I saw it. Um, uh, Patricia, could you um, have a look into Google yes, Doc? Yes, I'll take a look into the Google Doc and I'll see what happened. Thank you, Antonin. So the, the attention mechanism is, um, it was developed to, to mimic our collective attention to, to address the weakness of the onion. Uh, the onion will favor, somehow, but somehow we, as is a sequence of elements, it will favor the recent elements. And then it will fail to deal with very long sequences. Okay. Um, and the attention, it can... The goal is to model dependency between elements in a sequence without regard to distance be between them. So we don't have any more um, the impact of the, the sequence order. So, okay. Attention is an interface that connects the encoder and decoder that provides the decoder with um, information from encoder hidden states, okay? So the, the hidden states here from the encoder um, will be passed to a decoder and decoder will take into account of the only hidden states here. We will interact with and compute um, com compute some values to improve, to, um, to produce the next uh, value in itself um, hidden layer, okay? Um, so with, with, this, with this framework, the model is able to focus on value parts of the input sequence in a selective manner. And then it will learn the association between them. Okay. So they, they will have the model to cope with um, very long input sentences. There, there, are quite, uh, there are quite a number of uh, attention types out there. The global attention, it will consider all hidden states, a local attention will only one or a few selected one. Um, there's on so um, other things like hierarchical nested attention that will consider both um, at both levels of word and sentence. In so imagine we have a, a huge text of uh, several sentences, and they are depending um, dependent on to each other. Okay. And then, let's just come back to this. We, in, in the machine translation problem, uh, we start by one fixed, uh, vector, fixed length vector. We replace by a tension mechanism. Um, and then we still have the, the neural networks uh, in type of a recurrent neural network or LSTM. The, the throwback is still there. The RNN is, it works in a sequential manner. It takes time. Uh, it has a problem of a gradient, uh, the vanishing or uh, exploding gradients. Okay. Um, so we need to improve. And there, the, the, the idea of transformer has come. It's still uh, encoder, decoder uh, structure architecture, but now it uses only a tension mechanism for global dependencies to obtain the global dependencies between input and output. And the type of attention here is a self attention, um, which is a specific type of attention. And the difference between the self attention and attention is that instead of relating an input to an output sequence, the self attention will focus on a single sequence, an input sequence, to compute its representation. 
So that a model can also learn the intra input and intra output dependencies as well. In a transport model, there's no recovery or convolution. And to maintain the information of uh, element ordering, the, 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 the use um, positional encoder to, to encode um, the position of words in a sentence, for example. Um, in a, a layer more uh, advanced, that is a large language model. There's a type of neural network uh, that might use of transformers or something else, of course. And but uh, the 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 most successful is uh, transformers, we say. That that's a type of neural network that has the ability to generate text reflecting human language by inspecting vast amount of text data that, that, that you see with a chat GPT, for example. So there are two um, popular types of uh, LLM is a word and GPT. One is uh, the word can be seen as the, um, how say, encoder only um, model. And TBT is something can be seen as a decoder only architecture. They, so they, they are, quite different in, 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 in the design. Okay. Um, and so I, I would say the transformer attention mechanism, uh, large language model, they have a great potential for application for in, in, in different aspects, including life sciences. So there, there are quite a lot um, applications uh, for now, recently, um, for example, the especially large language model in predicting protein structure, um, predicting the, the the impact of uh, protein variants. Um, also, usually, uh, recently they 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 built uh, the markers just mentioned. Also, they built a foundation model for uh, human single cell transcriptomics, and one for uh, one foundation model for human genomics as well. Uh, based on uh, TPT model, that's called SCGPT, say. Um, so I, I I plan to just do four methods there, but um, as I, um, I saw one question about uh, generative adversarial networks, I should mention um, uh, a bit about that. Okay, that's, um, so this uh, this one is also an approach um, to uh, to generate uh, generative modeling that use deep learning, of course. Um, and the goal is to produce to generate new content. Um, it's about automatically discovering and learning patterns in input data, and then. The model can be used to generate new examples that probably could have been for from the original data set. Um, okay. So the, the, the idea is we we have a random input, we have a, a model for generating. Um, it will generate some samples, and then we have another model. So both model here are neural networks. So this model will generate some samples and this model will discriminate them. I mean, they, it will classify to see if the models uh, it obtains is the real or the fake. I mean, it's the real or it's the sample one and this generated one here, okay? And after several uh, turns of uh, updating, it will be able to, um, to, to distinguish ones, the real ones and the fake ones. Okay. Um, and of course, the, 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 the main application of this is about uh, generating data when we have, we don't have enough data, for example, in the, for, for once we have imbalance uh, problem, when we, when, once we have, we don't have enough data in one class, uh, for example, we need to generate data or for example, uh, some years ago, for, for now it's okay, but well, not okay. 
uh, we don't have uh, enough single cell uh, ownership data. So we need to cherish them to, 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 to be able to perform uh, deep learning, for example. Okay, um, so about deep reinforcement learning. Um, I would say reinforcement learning is um, one of the three basic machine learning paradigms, okay, uh, along with uh, unsupervised and supervised learning. So for, imagine in, in unsupervised learning, you say that thing is like this other thing. It's like we, we, we don't care about what it is, what they are. We just say that they, they are the same. They, they, they are very similar. And the, the algorithms, the unsupervised learning, the algorithms will learn the similarities um, without class, without labels, without names. Uh, um, they can just say they are uh, they, they, they're similar. And by this, we can um, we can detect some abnormal behavior. We can uh, recognize something that's unusual or, or dissimilar to the normal ones. In in supervised learning, uh, that's about we say when we say that thing is, for example, a double bacon cheeseburger. For example, we we put a labels, we put in names to something, and the, these algorithms will learn the correlations between the data, uh, the samples, to the labels, and then they 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 require a label data set, of course. Okay. Um, so the labels they they are used to supervise. They will use to be used to correct the algorithm, and and we'll correct the algorithm when the the, the algorithm is wrong. You correct based on the label it knows um, to improve the problem, to improve the model. Sorry. And the next one, I mean the third one, is about our topic here: reinforcement, reinforcement learning. Um, something like it would say we each that thing because it tastes good and we keep you alive uh, longer. So we have an actions based on short and long term rewards, such as the amount of uh, calories you ingest or the length of time survive. Okay, so and the reinforcement learning can be thought as a supervised learning in environment uh, of feedbacks. So that we have an agent. So an agent uh, will take actions. For example, a throne will make some delivery. The Super Mario in the game will navigate in a video game. Uh, in, in its uh, playground. Um, the algorithm is also an agent. And in life, the agent is you. Of course. We have environment. Um, the world for which the, the agent moves, okay? And which responds to the agent, okay? So the environment will check the agent's current state and the action of the agent and returns the output to the agents. Um, Just a question from Andrea. Um, I, I I think for single uh, single cell RNA seq, um, and then the. the Current paper is not published yet, um, but there is one work very, very well known about the SCGPT. Um, it's a, the, the foundation model for for single cell data, single cell aura uh, transcriptomics data, and it includes quite a number of of cells. I mean, about uh, hundred millions or something, uh, if I remember well. So it is a foundation. We imagine like it becomes a model like ChatGPT. We have uh, we have something, a basic one there, um, and then we can 
we, we can compare, we can al analyze our uh, data based on this uh, foundation. So um, might, be, um, might be you don't need to generate static data uh, anymore. That, that, that's why I, I think, um, but I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about how good uh, a generative uh, model can generate static data because, um, well, it, we, 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 we need a, a specific question, a biological question to, to test. And uh, I mean, the way that we generalize our data will depend a lot on our question um so if is a uh, deep learning or other things like um um like a bayesian uh bayesian network etc for the basic methods i'm not sure if um how, how they are compared to each other um yeah um so uh just come back to reinforcement learning Okay, we have an agent. The agent will perform some action, um, and the environment will receive the action and give a feedback to the agent. Okay, by by some reward, uh, some reward. Okay, um, so the 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 agent will take this reward, then it will adapt his action, and and so on. That, that that's the way that the reinforcement uh, re learning uh, works. So here you have look, you have state, um, you have action, you have the state of the Asian, you have a neural network. Okay, so we need to compute, we need to output a um, a Q values. Okay, that that's the how say the, the the action value. The expected long-term return, like um, it's not a short-term reward, it's something um, a long-term. What we have in long-term, if we live longer or, or not, not just um, we receive how many calories when we eat some burgers, but just if we live longer or not, that's, that's the case. So um, the, the neural network here will Take the action stage, can compute the return, the reward, and then to optimize this, and then infer the, in somehow optimal policy is that the action of the of the agent. Okay, um, so I think this one might be useful. Um, of course, it, it, it was applied in different. Um, different uh, subjects but um, it might be more useful in kind of in brain machine interface for example that where we have action we have an interaction between human and machine um, like in in rob robotics as well <laughs> 